Good morning. Welcome to morning prayer on this lovely Tuesday morning. If I look remarkably similar to the way I did yesterday, it's because I am recording this on Monday afternoon. Um, I have a conflict this morning, and so I am pre-recording this and also pre-recording tomorrow. And then they'll pre they're, they'll show up in your feed at the correct time um, on Tuesday and Wednesday. So let's take a moment and connect with this new day, the God who made us, and then we'll begin. Our service today begins on page 80 of the Book of Common Prayer. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his for he made it and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. The Psalms for today are Psalms 45 and 47. 45 and 47. My heart is stirring with a noble song. Let me recite what I have fashioned for the king. My tongue shall be the pen of a skilled writer. You are the fairest of men. Grace flows from your lips because God has blessed you forever. Strap your sword upon your thigh, O mighty warrior, in your pride and in your majesty. Ride out and conquer in the cause of truth and for the sake of justice. Your right hand will show you marvelous things. Your arrows are very sharp, O mighty warrior. The peoples are falling at your feet, and the king's enemies are losing heart. Your throne, O God, endures forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate iniquity. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows. All your garments are fragrant with myrrh, aloes, and cassia, and the music of strings from ivory palaces makes you glad. King's daughters stand among the ladies of the court. On your right hand is the queen, adorned with the gold of Ophir. Hear, O daughter, consider and listen closely. Forget your people and your father's house. The king will have pleasure in your beauty. He is your master, therefore do him honor. The people of Tyre are here with a gift. The rich among the people seek your favor. All glorious is the princess as she enters. Her gown is cloth of gold. In embroidered apparel, she is brought to the king. After her, the bridesmaids follow in procession. With joy and gladness, they are brought and enter into the palace of the king. In place of fathers, O king, you shall have sons. You shall make them princes over all the earth. I will make your name to be remembered from one generation to another. Therefore, nations will praise you forever and ever. Clap your hands, O you peoples. Shout to God with a cry of joy. For the Lord Most High is to be feared. He is the great King over all the earth. He subdues the peoples under us and the nations under our feet. He chooses our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout the Lord with the sound of the ram's horn. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. 
For God is king of all the earth. Sing praises with all your skill. God reigns over the nations. God sits upon his holy throne. The nobles of the peoples have gathered together with the people of the God of Abraham. The rulers of the earth belong to God, and he is highly exalted. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Ecclesiasticus. Wisdom praises herself and tells of her glory in the midst of her people. In the assembly of the Most High, she opens her mouth, and in the presence of her hosts, she tells of her glory. I came forth from the mouth of the Most High and covered the earth like a mist. I dwelt in the highest heavens, and my throne was in a pillar of cloud. Alone I compassed the vaults of heaven and transversed the depths of the abyss over waves of the sea, over all the earth, and over every people and nation I have held sway. Among all these I sought a resting place, in whose territory should I abide. Then the creator of all things gave me a command, and my creator chose the place for my tent. He said, make your dwelling in Jacob, and in Israel receive your inheritance. Before the ages, in the beginning, he created me, and for all the ages I shall not cease to be. In the holy tent I ministered before him. And so I was established in Zion. Thus in the beloved city he gave me a resting place, and in Jerusalem was my domain. I took root in an honored people, in the portion of the Lord, his heritage. The word of the Lord. So this is a fun one. Um, I mentioned when we started Ecclesiasticus that um, one of the things that's notable about it is that it personifies the figure of wisdom and that it talks about the pursuit of wisdom as the fear of the Lord and all of this. Um, so here we meet the figure of wisdom for the first time. Um, and it's a woman. Uh, and so later on, they have a little fun with that where they play the figure of wisdom off against uh, the, a figure of foolishness, and so you kind of have a virgin whore dichotomy going on. Um, but for our purposes, the figure of wisdom over time um, in the late First Temple Judaism period and into the Second Judaism period begins to get grafted onto a Neoplatonism idea about... Um, about the origins of life. Um, and so Platonic thinking held that the source of all things kind of, if you think of Plato's The Cave, um, everything on earth that we know about has um, sort of a, a shadow that we see and we interact with, but we know what the thing is because we understand the essence of the thing and the ideal of it, which exists on another plane. Um, and so that idealized essence of the thing begins to merge in Jewish thought with the figure of wisdom. Um, and it get wisdom figure begins to slowly morph into um, this platonic philosoph philosophical idea of logos or the word. Um, or this created essence of the world, um, the essential order of things, the essential rule by which things operated. Um, and if you're, that Logos thing sounds familiar, it's because it's in the prologue of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. So the wisdom tradition is actually really important for us as Christians because this is part of where the early church thinkers um, began to kind of put together an idea about who Jesus was, um, because they had this figure of wisdom, 
um, in that we could sort of figure out the natural world and figure it out, figure out how God was running things because there was this, this figure of wisdom. Wisdom pre-exists everything. We hear wisdom talking about how I was before all things and God delighted in me and I dwelt in Israel in this very particular way. So we have this very convenient figure of wisdom, which is depicted as feminine. And then that slowly kind of gets a nice sprinkling of Greek thought um, and then transforms into logos. And so by the time you get to the Gospel of John and that community, um, they recognize in the figure of wisdom a sort of not quite Christology, but approaching it. Um, so anytime we talk about the figure of wisdom, it's exciting because it's like, oh, seeds of Christology. Or it might just be me who's excited, you know. One of those things that I get excited about. But we will continue now with canticle number 13. Which is just straight up exciting. Everyone gets excited about canticle 13. Glory to you, Lord God of our fathers. You are worthy of praise. Glory to you. Glory to you for the radiance of your holy name. We will praise you and highly exalt you forever. Glory to you in the splendor of your temple. On the throne of your majesty, glory to you. Glory to you seated between the cherubim. We will praise you and highly exalt you forever. Glory to you beholding the depths in the high vault of heaven, glory to you. Glory to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We will praise you and highly exalt you forever. A reading from the Revelation of John. The second woe has passed. The third woe is coming very soon. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the king of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Then the twenty-four elders who sit on the thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, singing, We give you thanks, Lord God Almighty, who are and who were, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath has come. And the time for judging the dead, for rewarding your servants, the prophets and the saints, and all who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple, and there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. The word of the Lord. So we're, we're beginning to come to the climax of Revelation. And um, again, this is, this is genre literature. Like I've been saying, we have rules for genre literature. Um, it's an apocalypse. And in an apocalypse, we always have our rules, right? It's descriptive, not proscriptive. Events in heaven parallel events on earth. Um, it's incredibly allegorical, so everything has a double meaning. Um, and the, the theme that it hammers home is that um, God's people are saved, even when it feels like there's no hope. Um, and so here we see, um, we see the turn about to happen. In every apocalypse, there's a great reversal. Um, Jesus talks about how the last will become first and the first will become last. The apocalypse genre is all about how that happens, watching that happen. Um, and this is the moment in the revelation to John where we see the shift about to take place. Um, because the seventh angel blows his trumpet. Seven's always a really good number. It's the number of the incarnation, which again, everything's allegorical. The numbers are really important. So in uh, Jewish numerology, three is the number of heaven. Three is always a nice number. Even in, rhetor in rhetorical stuff, you always use the rule of three in jokes. Um, three things are funnier than two or four. Um, 
Three is the number of heaven. Four is the number of earth. Um, and so when you get seven, it's the number of the incarnation because four and three are coming together. So seven is a very nice sparkly number. So the seventh angel blows his trumpet um, and the, the heavenly hosts get very excited and, and come out with this line that you probably recognize from the hallelujah chorus. Um, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our God. Um, which is the moment in the Messiah every year where I start to cry because um, the, the thrust of the apocalypse is that um, even though it appears for all intents and purposes that the empire holds uh, all the power, um, the will of God is to decisively intervene in historic events and save God's people. Um, God never lets um, uh, historic events run on too long before God intervenes and decisively um, writes the world. Um, and so this is the moment where God does that. God, God intervenes. God establishes the kingdom of heaven in the, the very basic sense where the kingdom of heaven is God working within um, created events in order to work out God's will. So God now is intervening. And this is the moment of the incarnation. Jesus comes to earth and God has started the recreation process. Um, again, because Revelation is descriptive, not proscriptive. It's giving us a heaven view of what's been happening this whole time um, rather than De rather than telling us what's going to happen in the future. So um, the incarnation happens. Um, heaven and earth are joined in a, in a fundamental way that they hadn't been before. Um, and the, the judgment has begin begun. But listen to what the judgment is described as. For judging the dead, for rewarding your servants, the prophets and the saints, and all who fear your name and for destroying those who destroy the earth. And God's temple in heaven is opened and the ark is opened. So there are two things I wanna point out here. Um, one is that the, the temple is open, the ark is opened. One of the things about the ark, if you pay really close attention to where it shows up in the Old Testament, um, you can't ever look in the ark. You can't go in there. If you look at it, if you've watched Indiana Jones, then your face melts off. It's very bad. Here for the first time, um, the God becomes physically present in some way with humanity, with the created order. And it's a very big deal. There's lightning and thunder and the, you know, you get this natural like revolt around that moment. Um, but I also want to lift up for destroying those who destroy the earth. Um, one of the very popular American ways of reading Revelation is that Revelation is the story of how God destroys the earth. Um, well, it's not that. <laughs> because of this line right here, um, one of, one of the aims of God in the incarnation, according to this you know, fantastical allegory that we're being given here, is that God is coming to protect creation. God is coming to protect the created order. God is coming to recreate it, to transform it, but ultimately to save it. Um, God does not destroy that which God has created period. Um, God destroys those who destroy the earth. Um, that's a, that's a pretty big deal. Um, you know, the, I, I really kind of want to harp on that for all the people who worry that revelation is a story about how God like destroys the earth and does creation. It's fundamentally not, um, because of lines like this. It is, it is very clearly not about the destruction of the world, 
by God. God is not about destroying the world. God is about saving the world. Um, and God is about protecting the world from those who would destroy it. Which again, it's pretty cool. See, this is why Revelation is a fantastic book. And it needs more love. So we will continue. with canticle number 18. Splendor and honor and kingly power are yours by right, O Lord our God. For you created everything that is, and by your will they were created and have their being. And yours by right, O Lamb that was slain, for with your blood you have redeemed for God, from every family, language, people, and nation, a kingdom of priests to serve our God. And so to him who sits upon the throne and to Christ the Lamb, be worship and praise, dominion and splendor forever and forevermore. A reading from the Gospel according to Luke. As Jesus was speaking, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts that nurse you. But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. When the crowds were increasing, he began to say, This generation is an evil generation, for it asks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For just as, this, but for just as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so the Son of Man will be to this generation." The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with the people of this generation and condemn them because she came from the ends of the earth to listen to the wisdom of Solomon and see something greater than Solomon is here. The people of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the proclamation of Jonah and see something greater than Jonah is here. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it in the cellar, but on the lampstand, so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But if it is not healthy, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, consider whether the light in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, with no part of it in darkness, it will be as full of light as when a light gives you light with its rays. The word of the Lord. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day we bless you. We praise your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy on us, Lord, have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy, for we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope, and we shall never hope in vain. Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and charity. And that we may obtain what you promise, make us love what you command. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. 
O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life and to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us, your humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries. Through the might of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth, and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you, bring the nations into your fold, pour out your spirit upon all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I ask your prayers at this time for those who need our intercessions, either named aloud or silently. For those who are sick, for those struggling to resist oppression, racism, homophobia, transphobia, sexism, all forms of hatred and bigotry. For our nation as we approach the election, May we pursue that peace which flows from justice and righteousness. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. I will see you tomorrow. Take care.